And to this day, mail is a problem delivering mail in all parts of Cyprus. And so while he was doing these things, he would visit a lot of villages in the Nicosia district. Nicosia is the capital, but it also includes a lot of small villages and farmers. And he, where we traveled, he took pictures, so I to talk. Now this is a picture, they put it in a flat area, but now they have to separate it from the chat. Uh, or, or pulverize it, I should say. The, to separate from the chat, they throw it up in the air to, you know. What I'm showing you here is the underneath side of the threshing board. Flints embedded into the underside of the threshing board. These are chipstone flints, just like we find in many parts of the world, all around here. They still use this two or three hundred flints in every one of these threshing boards. They use them still in Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Albania, Bulgaria, in Cyprus, not so much. Anymore. And the next slide shows women sitting in a chair attached to a threshing board so they can do the stalling or nurse their babies at the same time. <laughs> Jensen liked to talk to people and he was interested in everything. And these are his drawings that I'm going to show you. This is one of my favorite tools. It's, anybody know what this is? Oh, you read it already. It's just a stick with a Y shape up at the top. And it's so to support the basket on one side attached to a donkey before loading another basket on the other side. The Cypriots love their donkeys. And they don't want them to be in pain. So this was uh, one of the tools that he uh, described. On his third tour of duty in 1971 is when he began to study these great big jars. And the jars are gigantic. They're called Pitaria. No one had ever written about them. In Cyprus. And Cypriots really don't like them very much. They are extremely heavy. Eight men to carry it, and three men and a donkey or a backbone. Extremely heavy. And for most people, it's just an unwanted, smelly old thing that's taken up space in their house. And some of them had Christian markings on them as well as symbols of the folk belief. Here's a cross up here, and this is the snake going all around it. And the hope is that these two symbols would protect the wine so that it wouldn't turn into vinegar. Most of these jars date to the 18th or early uh, 20th century, but some of them are older. And we know this because they had dates on here is Knut Jensen, 1971, sitting in a fermentation. He did this over and over and people take pictures of him inside the jar. And he usually would travel with a UN colleague, and that person also went into the jar. And the little kids were so amused by this. You know, why would anybody want to do this? The little kids, they told him, you're bad. We're going to put you in that big jar. <laughs> and they couldn't get out by themselves. So, um, it was one month before Nelson's third tour of duty was over. He tried going to study these charts. But there's a policeman who was intrigued by the fact that they had writing on them and they were dated. And he thought maybe this would be his contribution to Cypriot archaeology. His dream was not just be an archaeologist, but a Mediterranean archaeologist. So, here is a date. 1767. And here is a stamp. They couldn't read the letters. It's very hard to read what's written in the wet clay on these jars for many different reasons. Um, they are, uh, they're written a long time ago. You know how our script has changed, the way we write letters changed a little bit. 
And there are a lot of abbreviations. And even the owners don't remember which one of their ancestors commissioned um, these drawers. Jensen wrote that he heard he saw two Swiss tourists. And he went up to them and talked to them. What are you doing? And they said, oh, we're doing a study of church facades or something. And he thought, they came all the way here from Switzerland to walk around the country and study these little churches. And it was late that day, he wrote in the diary, I think I could go around the country drawing jars and see what I come up with. And that's what he did. And you see, this is a page in one of his notebooks. Now, I learned about Manson indirectly. After I'd been in Cyprus for seven months, I was almost finished with my research, and somebody said to me, Gloria, uh, here's a manuscript somebody wrote. You might be interested. Nobody else cares about this stuff in Cyprus. You might be interested. And um, this, the manuscript that he wrote is 44 pages, written in English, because Jensen had managed to identify some of the journals. The jar makers sometimes wrote their name and their village, or their initial and their village, when they made jars. And um, he had traced two jar makers back to their home village. I was told I could read the manuscript, but I couldn't quote it. I couldn't make a reference. I couldn't make a copy, just read it. So I read it and I said, thank you very much. Here it is. And, but I did write down the address that was in there in five four ten. And the next month, without realizing it, uh, that he had died for a little bit of year. He died in April. And this was now in November. And I wrote to his the address and said, I would help you publish it. It was written in English, which is not his, his mother tongue. It needed, it, the whole thing needed work. Um, but my offer was politely declined by his wife. Over the next 30 years, every once in a while, maybe four or five times, I sent Christmas cards. Every time I came across it in my notes, I was going through my notes. Oh, I haven't written to him for a few years or the family. So I wrote, and it was five years ago that his son in law wrote to me. And he said that. Uh, they didn't know anything about the English manuscripts that I was referring to, but they knew it against him one the time he was published, because you always publish your research about Danish technology. And they knew his dream was to be a Mediterranean archaeologist. So they said, if you don't know anything about the manuscript, maybe you can send a copy to the National Museum, because he always sent copies there. He sent six copies to Cyprus to the villagers who are descendants of the father, but they weren't going to publish it. And then his son-in-law said the only thing they had were his diaries, his journals, with photos stuck in the page. But I like to see that. I get goosebumps every time I say that. So I wrote back, yes, please. They sent it to me, but little did I realize was that it's in Danish. <laughs> This is in Danish. Anybody here can read Danish? Well, I don't know Greek, and I don't know Danish. So, um, I was then able to write a book, Wine Jars and Jar Makers of Cyprus. Once I got people to translate the diaries for me. Nobody has ever written a book about um, these jars, which are the most majestic of Cypriot jars. When, so how did I find translators? I, I asked a few people and they told me I could pay this person, that person, and I didn't have money to pay anybody. But I wrote a message on the app or the webpage next door. You know the next door webpage? Mm -hmm. Yes. Next door webpage, you want to sell something, you want to rent something, you're looking for a babysitter, I don't know. It's here in Spokane. Yes. It, it's Seattle. Um, it's widespread, especially in my neighborhood. And you know, in Seattle, we have so many people 
who uh, immigrated from minority countries. And so I just put in a question there. Can anybody help me translate Danish diaries, diaries in Danish, written by a UN uh, police officer? And um, people told their friends about it. And eventually, people contacted me. And they were willing to help me. I also went to the Nordic Museum, Nordic Museum, uh, National Nordic Museum. They said, we translate letters for people. We can't translate whole diaries. But one woman said she didn't need her husband for a few months until it was time to plant again in springtime. And he had to turn the soil over for her. He was from Finland, but he could probably manage with the Danish. And he did. And he translated it for me. The, um, the people felt, you know, I asked them, why are you doing this for me? And they thought they were helping the UN. They believed in the United Nations. They have family members who have volunteered for uh, the United Nations. And they told me that his notebook, the writing was beautiful. It, it was so crisp and clear that they could do it. So uh, that's how I was able to uh, write the book. And in the book, he records the names of people. Now this little boy, he didn't record his name, but for many people, and he took pictures all the time. Uh, he did record their names, and I was able to trace some of those people. I was able to meet some of those people. And they remembered him. They remembered the man who asked to visit the local church. He, he was very uh, able to communicate with men and women. And men and women's worlds are very separate in Cyprus, but he managed to bridge the gap. Now he interviewed people, he talked to people all the time. I don't do that. Anymore. My work, ethnoarchaeology, I just didn't watch because I want to know about pottery. And if I said, how many types of pots do you make? What do you think the answer is? Oh, I make them all. <laughs> <laughs> it's like also, you say, what kind of pie do you make? You know, I can make any kind of pie, but I like pecan, I like apple, lemon meringue. That's normally what I make. I watch when making them. I wonder how long does it take to do every part of the pot? How many pots do they fire together? And so I just watch. But he spoke with everybody. He interviewed people. And he was a very good, you know how to interview. So we were basically studying the same things. We want to learn about the traditional pottery. But he did it his way by interviewing people. And he taught himself some Greek. He could read a little bit of Greek. And the way I do it is watching people. And he was able to record 60 jars. And he returned to Cyprus five times afterwards to uh, continue his research. His wife hated it. He would take a little vacation with her in the summer. It was so hot and humid. And she didn't want to fly either. But um, they did. Jensen wouldn't ask just one person a question, he would ask many people, like a police officer um, would do it. And then he would go back to the village and present people with a photo. Now, I don't know if you remember, but film used to be expensive. And making another copy of a photograph used to be expensive. These people treasure these photos because. I see everybody here remembers the time when you didn't have a telephone that could take pictures. Also, you know, people didn't have cameras. And I recently saw a photograph that he took on Facebook. This photo, book, this photo was posted on Facebook on the occasion of the 84th birthday of the oldest father in one of the villages where he was. They cherish the photos, they still have them to this day. People trusted him in Cyprus uh, to such an extent, it, it, it's almost unheard of. He showed, and uh, he was shown things that Cyprius won't even show other Cypriots, the family treasures. And this enabled him to make remarkable discoveries. And when he wrote in his notebooks, there were two main topics. Uh, 
anything that was unique for each recipient. On the one hand, on the other hand, anything that reminded him of home, Denmark. When he went to Argentina, when he would go for a four month tour of duty each time. And the women, of course, were thrilled that he knew about Britain. And he wanted to know each step, and he knew what to do. He could need it. And he wanted to taste the restaurants. He wanted to be there to see everything. And I think that he was uh, looking for the commonality and the humanity in all people. He saw horseshoes. There are a lot of people very superstitious. And the horseshoes are And so, you know, I never thought, how do you hang a horseshoe? With the opening up or down? Uh, up. Up. Everybody here says up. No down. Up means the good luck collects inside the horseshoe. Down means the good luck flows on anybody who walks in to the building. I didn't know that. Isn't that something? These are the types of things that he uh, wrote about. And this is why he was on duty for the UN, full time job that included night shifts, weekends, and at times potentially dangerous situations. One thing for sure, he didn't like driving on the other side of the road. <laughs> That was one thing that he uh, he wrote about. So he um, was very well liked by the Cypriots and by his uh, UN colleagues. I want to show you briefly how the jars were made. Here in the front, you see leaves covering the bottom part of the jar. These are the faces, the lower bodies that were made. First thing that the uh, I would do is to make these solid bases and cover them with fig leaves so they wouldn't dry out too fast. They were solid. And then then slowly add coils to get to this lower body shape. This is the lower part. Back here, there are completed joints. Here is Yannis Pilavakis, 1972, at his CD workshop, adding a clay coil as leaves are collected in the base because he's going to cover this coil again with these damp leaves so it doesn't dry out too fast. And here now he's smoothing it and he's going to set it aside to dry because it was not dry enough, not completely dry. But just harden it a little bit. It can't support the weight of more and more clay. So here they're making a series. This is the base. Next side, here are some rocks to support it because it's a pointy base. And then large jars, more complete, standing up in the back. How long do you think it takes to make one of these jars? More. Couple of months, two and a half months. Mm -hmm. You can only add a certain amount of clay each time, and then you have to wait and let it dry. Twenty days to dry, so it's almost completely dry. Three days to fire it. Now I'm going to show you the kiln. A kiln like this, 1961, the photo from the German archaeologist I mentioned before. It could hold ten large jars, small jars. Uh, piled up on top, and then the jars didn't touch the, the bottom of the kiln, it was too hot. Anybody here make pottery? So the wall and the uh, floor are too hot, so they just piled this up. You can see the pointy base. A lot of different reasons for the um, pointy base. No. Here's a close-up. They put some fuel in the middle. The, the middle part of the kiln was left empty, and they put some fuel in the middle. But for two days, there was a small drying fire outside of them. Just let it smoke the land to dry the cuts so they were uh, really, really dry. Otherwise, the whole thing could explode. So after they dried, they would roll them out. A lot of times they roll out the, the jars, which are heavy to carry. Better to roll them. 
And the men here have covered their heads with sacking and their hands because these jars are red hot. And they have to be red hot. This is a lid for one of the jars. They have to be red hot because they're going to line them with pitch or resin from pine trees to make them uh, leak proof, waterproof for the grape juice they're going to put in. And here they're just smearing around the um, uh, the pitch, which is boiling hot. Here's Mrs. Filibaki's also helping. Um, the uh, black that you see on the rim is just by chance. It's not decoration. Doesn't mean anything. And now I'll show you a picture of where most of these jars are ending up. Pitch line jars and smaller pots at the most of the tea and pouring them. People just get rid of them. They, they're too heavy, they take up too much space. Some of them are cracked. And so they have no use for them anymore. Although they do sell, and today you get, they really cost a lot of money. The jars were for fermenting wine. They put grape juice in there and seal it for as much time as was needed, up to a year, and then transport the wine in uh, goat skins that were also lined with pitch. And that's why we talked about the Redsina wine, Res the wine that tastes like resin, because they line the goat skins with the resin, just like the jar was. A lot of people don't like that taste. But others do. Some people say it's good for you, so you should drink it. Another use for these jars was for a sauna for new mothers, at least until the 1970s. A new mother, 40 days after birth, no, sorry, 20 days after birth, there'd be a ritual sauna performed by the midwife. And the jar would be on its side a little bit. A little stool would go in after the midwife had uh, burned wood inside. Burned wood, heated up the jar, and cleaned it out with water, created a lot of steam. They put the stool in, in went the new mother to sit for uh, about 10 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes, while the midwife prepared another herbal mix to wash the woman in. And then she went back in there for another little bit until it had Cool that these are Jensen's drawings again. Now here the upper body of a broken Picard is reused as a wellhead. They just stuck it on top of the wellhead. And you can see the rim is worn. Um, you know, it's not a nice straight line. And I copied Jensen's drawings. This is from the rope pulling on the pulling up the water all the time. And here you see a broken large jar reused to wash clothes. In 2014, in the village where I've been working recently, they were still they put a drain, a metal drain, uh, in the bottom, in the center. And uh, you see in other jars here, they're, they're still washing clothes. They usually boil the clothes, and they are so immaculately white. The white stuff, I mean, I wish I had clothes that were uh, sheets of towels that were that white. And here is a woman using another type of a wash basin. This was made as a wash basin. This is not a broken jar. And you see, you see a little soap dish over here. So these people could make practically anything from uh, clay, anything that they needed. The Jensen drew so many uh, jars. This is just a sampling of some of the designs, the dates, uh, and other information that he recorded. And now I'm going to show you one of his most important jars. This has a snake with two heads applied to a jar in the village of Chicago. Sometimes there's a snake in a tail. This one had two heads. I don't know why. And this jar said, Saturday, September 5th, 1892, Maheras Monastery burned and nothing was saved but while making a jar in the village near the monastery, 
the fire saw the smoke. There's a very famous fire, huge fire, a very famous monastery, and he wrote about it in the journal. And so this is the only external evidence there is of this jar. And the villagers never showed it to anybody because they were afraid it would be confiscated by the Department of Antiquities. And I'm afraid that it was. But it wasn't because uh, it, nothing that he that Jensen did. Now, what was so rare about this jar is it had a lot of writing in it. It also had names of people and the village of Lazana. And so, um, one of the reasons it's so important that Jensen recorded this information is because we asked, why do people write on Roman era jars, on Bronze Age jars? What does that writing mean? And Jensen decided that he would go to the village of Lazania to see if anybody could help him understand um, what was there. And he first time I went to the village, nobody was there. It's a village in the midst of um, wine country. Um, and probably everybody was out in the field working. Next time he went there, he met the village priest, an old guy who didn't speak any English, but he saw the initials that Jensen had copied down because um, above the snake head here, there is writing that's very difficult to see. It was done with a tool. It's not very deeply engraved. And the priest said, Papoose, my grandfather. And then he said something else that was to say, my nephew or my cousin. This is my cousin. Jensen managed to meet the descendants of the German, the Shalazanya, the village of Lazanya. The priest didn't make jars, but his father and his uncles and another side of the family made the jars. And the priest said, You gotta to talk to my uh, my son. My son speaks English. The son had been to New York, worked in a restaurant in Astoria, uh, oh. New York. His uncles and aunts had immigrated to New York a long time ago. And so this was how, Yen how Jensen was able to learn so much about um, the jar makers. And um, the jar makers did not just make jars in their home village. Usually, they worked wherever the jar was needed. They were itinerant, itinerant fasting. They would make the jars in the farmer's backyard because they were so big. Cyprus is such a hilly country. You can't move these jars in the day. So the potters, the jar makers, went to where the jars were needed. And usually they tried to convince people to make more than one jar at a time because they had to live in that village two and a half months. Sometimes they married somebody in the village. Sometimes they went to the nearby village. Because of Jensen's police work here, we can trace this one father, this young man, between the age of 18 and when he married at 22. We know where he wants to make jars. This is what Jensen was able to do. He was really remarkable. And as I said, whenever he saw something that reminded him of home, he wrote about it. This is a publication by Jensen before he joined the UN in 1954. This is Danish sourdough bread as a cross made with the sign of the woman. And he observed the same thing in Cyprus. And when he saw this, and he knew what he, what he was seeing, and he knew what he was doing, he really connected with the people. This is one of the villages where I've been working. I was Demetrius, way up in the Trotus Mountains, where it is nice and cool every night. No matter how hot it is, every place else. And these, um, the, the um, background is covered with vineyards. And there are even vineyards in between the houses. Here. In between these houses, there are fruit trees and vineyards. And there are still people making, well, there were still people making pottery until the year 2000. Here, a Rodu was finishing a series of jars. 1986, when I was in Iceland, for the very first time. And as you see, these also have rounded bars, but these are much smaller. For the most part, it was men who made the great big jars because they traveled and spent two months away from home. 
And you know what nice Cypriot girls went to there. So um, they concentrate on this war about Syria's will do, and her sister Andriana firing their own kiln, which is filled with maybe 200 pieces of cookware, jugs, ovens, and other small pots, 1986, wood burning kilns, no electricity, no gas, uh, nothing like that. Um, the people who translated the text, the, the diaries for me, called them diaries. One of them was a retired psychologist. She was thinking about retiring and wanted something to do once she retired. And so she said she would cry, she would read a little bit. And she enjoyed it so much, she read all six books. <laughs> and she said that Jensen was humble, non judgmental, respected by all, and demonstrated superior social skills. Systematic observations that were authentic and believable. It wasn't just hearsay or his impressions. She could tell in the way he wrote that it was. So I thank you for inviting me to um, talk to you about Kim Jensen. And as I said, the people who did the translations all believe in the United Nations. And they believe in its mission. And they also told me that members of the royal Swedish and Danish families have joined excavations in Greece and in the New uh, We have been several great excavations for our brothers and And they do this to one of them. And the people in these neighboring countries know the members of the royal family go to the to FDA and they're proud of it. And they felt that they were helping all the way around by translating this. So I thank all of you for coming here tonight so that I can tell you the story of a rural police officer who fulfilled his dream to become a Mediterranean archaeologist. And if any of you want to do the same, it's possible. The AIA, Archaeological Institute of America, has lots of opportunities. You can't go to any, just any country. There's some countries that welcome all volunteers, Israel and Jordan, for sure. I have colleagues of two excavations in Jordan right now. And soon, Israel will be filled with volunteers from all around the world. And I invite you to Thank you. In every village, you know, I know people say that's a good question, but that is really good. I ask that all the time, and people have different recollections. You know, the last one was built in 1972, and I couldn't observe it. And but what I tell you that my work I observe, so I have to only rely on what people remember. So one man remembers, yes, when he was four years old, uh, in 1910 or something, somebody came to the village and they made a pot. And they remember, yes, somebody came and married somebody. But the, the answer is that in almost every village, there was a brick town. Everybody needed bricks. And they made bricks almost every place. And so they could fire one kiln, one of these jars in a brick kiln. And the way they would do it, they would take apart the kiln a little bit and then put the jar in and then rebuild it. And bricks are much easier to fire than the pots. But um, other people tell me that they fired the jars where they built them. I find that hard to believe. Some people say they dug a hole and they sort of put wood in it. I don't know. I, I can't get confirmation on that. The last jar maker died, um, I think, in the early 80s. And his brother, who lived to be 94 or so, 
died very recently, but the brother never made a jar. You know, he didn't want to get his hands dirty. So he would tell me things, some believable, some a little less believable. <laughs> So who's going to sign up for an excavation? <laughs> it is so much fun. And you know, if you think it's too hot, it's whatever. You know what time we usually start work on excavation in Israel or Jordan? 4.30 oh. a.m. And we, we don't work all day. We stop around noon and have lunch, have a nap, do a little work afterwards. I'm completely missing the point of why can't they reuse the jars? They're not broken, they're still sealed with pitch. We use our oak barrels for making wine. Right. Um, it's because uh, let me come back to why can't why can't they reuse the jars? Because everybody wants modern today. Everybody wants, you know, do people do people want other their parents' old stuff? It's just a normal reaction. You don't want what the grandparents had or made. You want modern stuff. So now they make wine in plastic containers. It goes bad in two weeks. <laughs> and then they think, yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have gotten rid of that great big jar. But then they have to be relined because the acid in the wine eats away at the resin. And the way they line them is exactly the way they did in classical times. The classical writers describe, first you have to put a burning light into the jar to melt the old, whatever remaining. You melt it, you break it out, and then you have to melt the resin and pour it in. But you have to, you have to make the jar as hot as possible, so it will absorb it. Look, it's a lot of work. And that's one of the reasons I think they don't do it so much. Also, when Cyprus joined the uh, European Union, they were forbidden to raise, grow so many grapes. They say most French wine comes from Cyprus. I mean, a long time ago, there was life in France, and they went to Cyprus. Venetians went to Cyprus to get the wine and to get the roots and to grow over there in Italy. But uh, it, it takes a lot of work, and people want a lot of wine. Like that, everybody. Thank you very much.